you. Thank you, Ashdi, and everybody on that incredible um, a panel. There's so much richness there, and so I'm, I'm really happy that, I'm just gonna reiterate that we are gonna have these breakout sessions after this next panel where you'll be able to really talk in much more depth, see the video, um, be able to kind of understand how could I use this in my, in my classroom, my school system. So um, just big kudos to the group. I am now introducing the moderator for our, our third panel and um, so thrilled for you guys to see this group and everything that they've been able to accomplish. Um, she'll also gonna, it's gonna knock your socks off. So, but first let me introduce our moderator and um, Learning Sciences Exchange advisor who will be joining us. Oh, and this is a panel that has um, the, entire, the entire group is here in person. So we're gonna move some chairs to make sure we all can fit, but I'm really thrilled that we're all here. So I just wanna say a, a thank you and introduce, um, thank you to and introduce Pauline Essa, who will be our moderator for this next panel. Pauline is the Director of Research and Programs for Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, Education Sub-Saharan Africa, that has done a, a number of different um, projects and programs that are doing this kind of cross work across both continents and age groups and recognize the importance of data and research, but also the just the power of being able to work together. So we're thrilled to have Pauline with us. And I just wanna say a big thanks and to um, see if Pauline can join me at the podium and we'll get this one started. So thank you, Pauline. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a hard act to follow, having heard what the joy of science and, and also building belonging have done. But last but not least, we have a very powerful group of women who will be telling you all about the super diverse um, game kits that they've created. And it builds on what you've heard already, the joy of learning as well as um, building belonging, and they'll add some more spice to it. And so I'm really, really happy to be able to yeah, to be able to get um, the video up on the screen for you to see what they've been about and to, to be able to understand what we're going to be discussing later. Thank you. According to the official statistics, there are more than 65 million people who are forcibly displaced as we speak now. And by the year 2059, it's estimated to be 1.2 billion. And according to the numbers, 50% of migrants are children. That's a real problem and a real issue that we need to focus on. If a child does not see their cultural identity, mirrored back to them in their books, in their language, in their online environments, the characters they look at, they don't feel fully included, they don't feel represented. So for teachers to recognize the aspects that the child is bringing with them into the classroom, it's actually a basic necessity for full-on learning. In the science of learning, when learning happens really well, one of the main key things is to be able to utilize prior knowledge or sometimes what's known as indigenous knowledge systems, where you have a hook in your own experience that you can hook new, new knowledge onto. As we decided we were gonna work on this question of migration and identity safety and culture, we started doing desk research on how that works in children's contexts. The research includes desk research on articles and resources and links or also field research. So I traveled to Turkey. Through this project, I was able to interview migrant groups from different age groups like adults and as well children. And we also decided to have expert interviews where we virtually interviewed experts in the field of migration or education or culture. We also developed a survey for teachers based on research to get their perspective on how they talk about culture in their classrooms or the practices that they might be engaging in that would make children feel identity safe in their classrooms. We also conducted an audit of existing games. And that's when I think we started to really dive into this idea of games as a potential approach. We started to go into what I would call a design process of really understanding what was the core challenge that we were addressing 
and then really going out into the world to kind of test that with real young people. And that's what we call the design diamonds. Then that's when we started our ideation process. So we worked with an amazing designer from Found Studio, and she became our real kind of facilitator and design guide in the process. Rather than start right in with game mechanics, we started with what do we want this experience to be like for these children? The emotions that we're aiming to target were empathy, and curiosity and confidence. According to research, we found that these emotions, when they are activated, the kids are going to feel more safe and a sense of belonging in their classrooms. So we ended up making three games. The first game we have cultural bingo. It's super easy to play because bingo is actually a very universal concept. People are moving around, playing it, finding out things about another person that they never knew. In the mystery box, the person who was doing the discovery in the box, couldn't see what the little artifacts were in the box. And inside of that box are a collection of objects that represent different cultures. And the last one was our emotion mural, which was very much about helping young people to bring their emotions and their feelings around cultural identity through creativity and through expression into the classroom. We know that kids learn best when they're active and when they're engaged and when they have some opportunity to discover things for themselves. That doesn't mean that we just let them freely wander and discover everything. We have to do that in a guided way, but kids need to be involved. They need to be at the center of the equation in order for real deep, true learning to happen. I think there was a sort of key moment when we realized that we would really like to set ourselves a goal of getting together, physically together, and actually being in a situation where we could co-create with, with young people. And so it made a lot of sense to utilize Emma's opportunity that she offered to us, which was, why don't you all come to Amsterdam? I was really excited that everyone was keen about co-creation because that's a core part of my work always. We designed the sessions in the classrooms to give the children a fun experience and get their input on those things that we could still change. I yeah, feel really proud because I saw my classroom in a way that I normally don't see them and I felt really proud about the way that they connected with each other and how they valued everybody's own opinion and they really listened to each other so I really like that. Yeah it's great because like there are so many interesting things to do like uh, the mystery box this is the best thing that I ever. I like the the part that we need to draw our emotions. I like the bingo. I can know friends better and uh, it's fun and I like it. I feel really happy now because everything was so fun. Migrant children have three main needs within the education system. So the first need is the need for cultural understanding, the need for them to be understood, and as well the need for them to understand the culture that they are in. Uh, the second need is the need to eliminate negative experiences, and this includes, of course, racism, discrimination, bullying, or exclusion. And the third area is the need for educational access. That's why in our project we have decided to focus on these needs with our product to build understanding Understanding, to eliminate negative experience and to allow access to education and improve learning. All of the games and the instructions and the materials for playing them are available freely on our website and hopefully this is going to make a real difference in the lives of some real children. I'm really proud of the work we did and I'm really proud of the foundational research and how clear it is and how that translated so clearly into some tangible experiences that I think are really wonderful for young people. And I'm really grateful for everyone and their contribution and everything that everyone did to help us get there. And it was just exceptional. And as you saw, the, there's a link to the, the games, but also for those of you in the room, we have the games here. 
in the studio, so you'll get to play with them. So without um, taking up any more time, let me introduce these amazing women who've been part of this super diverse game kit. Um, we'll start with Ima Bima, who's founder and of Designation Works in the Netherlands and who kindly hosted the group. We have Bethany Corby, who is um, co-founder and chief vision officer of Farm Studio in the UK. We have Mariam, who's just coming up now. Um, she is a filmmaker and journalist based in Egypt. We have Dina Weisberg, who is professor of psychology, psychological and brain sciences at Villona, Villanova University. And then last but not least, we have Maggie Worthington-Smith, who is a member of the research, innovation, and development team for E3 in the Department of Basic Education in South Africa. So a super diverse group of women here as well. Thank you. So now, we're all excited to hear more about your two-year fellowship and how you found the process and how you've come about with this amazing game that is really looking at cultural diversity and identity, bringing joy, bringing fun, bringing belonging to our young children to really help them grow into people who can bring about societal change, improvement, and feel like they have something to give to society. So I'll start off with Ema. Um, could you tell us, it's been a two-year process, but what, what do you think you've, you've gained out of this fellowship? What are your views on how this two-year fellowship has, has gone for you? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Pauline. So luckily, Pauline uh, uh, sent me the question beforehand, because obviously <laughs> two years is hard to summarize. Um, definitely a roller coaster um, with highs and lows. And I remember at one point, uh, there, you know, there was friction, but well, what are we focused on? Are we, you know, um, and then I'm not sure who said it, but uh, one of us uh, said, okay, ladies, we're all ladies. <laughs> um, we are all overachievers. Uh, we all really care about learning, getting the most out of this, doing our best, presenting something really cool after two years and learning from the process. And for me, anyway, that created a shared understanding that, okay, any uh, friction that's coming up, it's coming from this intention and, and the nature of us as humans. So, uh, yeah, that, that really helps share trust and, and understanding uh, of each other. Uh, can I make another point? Yes, please. Um, and then for me personally, so I'm the social entrepreneur on the team, but I'm actually also very much a designer creator. So from the research aspect, it was really uh, enhancing for me what I learned because I'm used to design research, I'm used to co-design, but uh, now we did like a full teacher survey and analyzed uh, the inputs uh, from different continents. Uh, we did a literature overview and, and took away the t key takeaways uh, from that. Uh, we had expert interviews with uh, yeah, different sectors and then, of course, all our own experiences. So, yeah, now my repertoire of, of where to glean inputs for creating new programs is, yeah, quite broadened and I understand those processes. So, that was great for me to learn. That's so good to hear that as part of trying to improve learning and sharing the science of learning, you yourself have also felt like you've learned in the process. And I must say, as an advisor to the group, I was also learning from them. <laughs> um, so it's been a win-win process all around. And we hope that our audience and those who use these game kits will be able to share that, that important science of learning with their families and with, with everyone else. I'll move on to Dina. Um, so just to follow up on Emma's um, talking about the process, and we'll, can you shed a bit more light for us on what that looked like? We've seen from the video that there were various ways in which you got to that end product, but yeah, a bit more information there. Yeah, so I have two answers to this question. One is kind of a group level one, and one is a little bit more personal. So on the group level, I think one of the things that helped us to gel very early on is that we came up with a name for our group. I actually don't remember who had suggested it first, but we were discussing children and resilience and what helps kids to be resilient in different environments. Um, and often the dandelion is used as a metaphor for that. You spread dandelion seeds all over the world, and they just root 
wherever they go. So between the cracks in a sidewalk or in a meadow, and we just all immediately grabbed onto that as the metaphor. So, so as the team, we are the dandelions. Um, and I think having that, as Emer was saying, having that kind of shared understanding and a shared identity as part of this team really helps to bring us together. On the personal note, as before, oh, she, oh, before sorry. I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> what she didn't say was she last night and today she gave us each a little <laughs> dandelion necklace. Oh. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Dina gave us. So we are all wearing our dandelions. That's it. Keep we'll, we'll keep We'll keep spreading them <laughs> across the globe. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and so just to just to follow up, as Emer was saying, and so as so many other people have said, to try to to try to learn from each other. Definitely, I had that experience very personally. So I'm the the scientist in the group, and scientists very much operate as kind of our own hegemony in our labs. And so like I get to decide what to do, and I get to set the the tone, and the you know why are we not just, like we should just be jumping in and, and doing things. And you guys want to go through all of these processes and come up with these plans. Like this was. Was just not a way that I tended to think in my research and actually taking a moment and being encouraged to step back and think about, okay, how do we design something in a very different way? We're not designing a research study, which is the thing I'm used to designing. We're designing the kind of process of developing these games and of bringing the research into a different space. So there was a moment where I really had to think about the way that I work and the way that other people work and having the opportunity to reflect on those different processes to kind of make that explicit where before it had been just the way that I do things has been just an incredibly helpful way to think about moving forward. That's great to hear. Um, I'll connect that to um, Maggie now. So looking at, I mean, LS exhibition, Lisa explained to all of us earlier and, and our, our co-founders as well. So the team had a task to come together, different minds, experiences, cultures, backgrounds, to build something, and you've done that. What do you think um, has been the, the, the collaboration, the cross-collaboration? How have you found that? How have you been able to get to this, the, this end goal? So if the question is, did we collaborate yes. and did we ultimately co-create, I would say, yes, 100%, we did. Did we do that e effectively and mostly very efficiently? Maybe not. <laughs> However, if we look at the objective beyond just the production of something, I would say, yes, we did, notwithstanding the fact that it was a difficult journey to get there particularly around the um, question of collaboration, which was the whole point of the exchange, actually. <clears throat> and I, I think that some of, the, some of the factors that affected that are, were not in our control. So there were external things like, you know, being in different continents, being in different time zones, having to meet virtually, etc. <clears throat> but with the way the, um, the world is at the moment, that's a global issue. So it wasn't, it's not unique to us. You have to, we have to find ways of getting over that anyway. And so I would, I would say for, you know, for future cohorts, Dina was awesome in um, sort of taking on the role of being the manager of us in terms of our time and getting us in meetings. And, and I think that was great. Once that, that landed, it really helped the efficiency of that collaboration. I think from the point of view of our own, what we personally brought to the collaboration, I think it was something that I learned um, through the process to, to be more considerate about the fact, or more conscious and aware about the fact that we're all coming from different cultures. We all use different languages, but and I don't necessarily mean languages, we may all speak English, but our understanding of the language is different and, and the words we use is different. Um, the, the, the fact that we're all leaders is really tough <laughs> because um, we, we lead different, with different ways of leading. And so in some respects, we pull back because we don't want to be too pushy as a leader. In some respects, you, pull, you push forward and then you are too pushy as a leader. And so it, was, it took a little while for us to find what our particular strengths were. And I think once we found that and we settled into our strengths a little bit more and we trusted each other on that, I think it really helped with our collaboration. But in a way, I wish we got there sooner, but maybe you can't... There's a lovely thing in the language I speak, uh, which means you can't push something to be ripened until it's ready. And so we got ready and we got ripe at the right time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear. So I'll come to you, Bethany. 
I know the whole group sees the importance of culture and identity and how this really needs to be embedded in the education process wherever we are. From your point of view, wh why is this so important? Can you just articulate it to the group, for instance? Yeah, so I think landing on the topic together actually happened quite early in the process. And I think we were interested in what I would call like a big, hairy, audacious challenge. And I think we all saw this as like a really challenging area. But I think we also leaned into that some of us had more lived direct experience with this topic um, and that we trusted that that experience was going to carry us through the journey. So I think that was really important that we landed on that topic and the kind of area that we wanted to tackle quite early. Because I think what it then allowed us to do is to dig kind of deeper into the kind of core elements of what might be causing these challenges, particularly in classrooms. And we, and we talked about that in the video. We, we leaned into some very intrinsic emotions in the process, which at least on a personal level, really kind of shifted things for me. When we went to these kind of intrinsic emotions that we felt were gonna be very supportive of young people in these complex, diverse cultural settings, that I think started to unlock something in our design process, in our ability to practically start to understand what we could do that was really helpful for us. And just to remind everyone the kind of intrinsic emotions that we kind of landed on was this ability for young people to be curious about their own cultures and ultimately then allow themselves to be curious about other cultures, to really be able to be empathetic about their own cultures and then to be empathetic to other cultures. And the, the last one was really about pride and respect, to be able to be proud of your own culture and have space to be proud, to then be able to do that for others. And this, I can only do it for others if I do it for myself, became this really universal foundation for us because this topic is enormous and complicated. And I think some of our challenge was just, it was so enormous and complicated that we were going in circles a lot, like, well, what can we do? How, how can we empower all teachers to do everything? And that's just a hard place to be in general. But I think when we started to get to these foundations that we could really design with, for me, that's when we started to be able to see where we could what I like to call kind of like social acupuncture, where we could put a, put a pin in, in the system somewhere that could start to relieve some of what we were observing. That, that was, I think, an important dimension of what we did. And the only other thing I would say is being able to work with young people and in real classrooms. You know, we made a decision very early on. We were going to use a significant portion of our budget to do that. It was a choice, which meant we couldn't do other things, but we made that choice, we made it together, we agreed to disagree on certain things, and we moved forward, and it was an amazing choice because it meant that we could interface directly with the reality of what was happening. And I think it just made it so much more meaningful for us, more meaningful for the people we were trying to serve. That's great to hear. And Mariam, let me bring you in now. Uh, as we saw from that non-scientific poll earlier, it's hard enough going to school in your own country, in your own locality, and feeling like you, you belong, let alone if you are in a situation where you are learning in, as a migrant in another country. So, Mariam, how, how do you think this toolkit that you've created could benefit migrant children who are learning in f f environments that they may not be so familiar with? Thank you so much for uh, this question. I think to answer this, we need to investigate what is preventing migrant children from learning well. And I think that the main reason is that they feel like they are strangers, unwelcome, and being seen as the other. So this otherness, we wanted to focus on uh, eliminating this sense of otherness. And by focusing on the needs of these children, like cultural understanding, the need to feel understood and understanding the new culture that they are in, and the need to eliminate any negative experiences that they are having. And this is what we wanted to focus on in uh, the toolkit. But also we went beyond that 
uh, by uh, investigating the root causes of these uh, needs. For example, from my work with migrants, I feel that one of the root causes is the lack of information and the lack of knowledge about each other's culture, and even the lack of interest to communicate and to learn about each other's culture, and also stereotyping, labeling, all these kinds of things. And when you see the toolkit that we have developed, we have developed the cultural bingo, for example. Uh, we are keen that children talk to each other and learn from each other. Even the teachers learn from the children. And also the mystery box, when they are exploring the artifacts about their culture and their very proud and respecting each other's culture. There is also the emotional mural where they express their emotions about their own cultures and traditions, uh, activating the emotion of empathy. So these kinds of emotions help to build channels of communication. And this is what we wanted to achieve, this kind of intercultural dialogue between the children and the teachers. And this kind of dialogue is what's going to tackle the root causes that I've talked about, like stereotyping or misinformation. So I think that this toolkit is going to help uh, improve the learning of migrant children through this kind of safety that they have to express themselves and their culture in the classroom. Amazing. I really hope those online, those in the room, are going to make use of this important resource that has been provided and that's freely available. It can be a game changer for local as well as migrant um, children. Ima, you kindly invited this group to the Netherlands um, for an in-person engagement, and you took them to a school where they got to interact with children and, and teachers, two schools, and teachers as well. And we heard in the video that one of the teachers was saying how I mean, surprised she was to see the, the, the joy and engagement from her students. We've talked about the children. How do you think the teachers as well, or parents, those who are working with these children, can use games like these to bring belonging and fun and joy and um, identity and culture to learning. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so because we came together in Amsterdam and we worked actually with children from 50 different uh, nationalities, um, so the games that we've now put online are tried and tested and then improved with their input. So, you know, fairly solid, good to go. Uh, we've licensed them with Creative Commons and made an editable version, so you can translate it uh, to another language, but you could also um, mix up some of the rules. Uh, so they're, yeah, pr very available, and you know we've put in our budget that it's online for a minimum of three years. Um, and we also, in our design criteria, made sure it could work in really low resource settings. So you only need paper and everything else you can find locally. Um, we've already used it twice. Uh, my colleagues from Designathon used it in uh, Kakuma, a refugee camp in the north of Kenya. And Miriam has plans with uh, migrant children in uh, Turkey. So uh, alongside ourselves, obviously, we hope uh, lots of people will pick this up and run with it. That's great. That's great. And Dina, we saw as well from the video that the children really seem to be engaging. And I think that brings satisfaction to you all as, as creators. Um, what, what, what of encouragement would you give to children in terms of yeah, using this, this game if, if they have the opportunity? Yeah. I think one of the amazing things that happened in the Netherlands is that children did not need any encouragement to use this <laughs> activity. I remember very vividly, we were in the very first classroom on the very first day, and I was so nervous. I don't know if anyone else had that, like, oh my gosh, we're here, we're doing this, we have some live, like, what is going to happen? Is this going to completely fall flat? Like, how, how, what kind of hubris do we have to think that these kids are going to like this game of bingo? This seems so simple. They were vibrating in their seats. Like we could not finish explaining the rules fast enough to allow them to get up and go and start talking to each other. Um, and so I, I think it's one of those situations where you just, you give it to them and, and they're there and they feel engaged. We had so many children who got bingo, who sort of won the game and got their four in the row and just kept playing because they were so excited to be moving around and getting to, to know each other. Um, so not to just 
deny the question that you've just asked me, Pauline, which is a great question. But I think that we feel really strong and really solid in this group of tools that if you are, as a teacher, willing to open up your classroom just that little bit to do something a little bit different, that, that the children just responded so amazingly. It was incredibly gratifying to see. That's great. The game sells itself. So that's the message. I have a follow-up yeah. comment on yeah. there about yeah. our experience in Amsterdam. There were very uh, two touching moments for me when we were playing the games. Uh, the mystery the box. Yeah. When we were playing the games, uh, the mystery box, I don't know if I should mention that, but there was a moment when we put the Ukrainian flag in, uh, in one of the mystery boxes, and it came that a Russian child was the one who picked it. And so we thought that, oh, th there might be a problem now, but then the child went to the uh, Ukrainian child and gave him his flag, and they shaked hands. Oh, wow. and it was very touching, like how lovely the children world is. They know no conflict, no hate, it's just peace and love. So this was a moment that was very touching. Another moment in doing the interviews, the child told me, I'm very proud of you and your team for coming here to do oh. these games with us. So this was like a testimony for life, <laughs> to be honest. So yeah, children are very honest, they don't lie. So yeah, I feel these were very two important moments. Well, ladies, very well done. An amazing achievement. This is just the beginning. And there'll be more coming out of it. Yeah. We wish you the very best, and thank you for an engaging session.